Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Man Team. Mega Bears Fan. With guest co hosts, Tanus Salpinus. The Buzzing. All right, so let's hope that everything goes smoothly today. <laughs> yeah, it could possibly go wrong. It's uh, seven minutes out of the show. We, uh, we're down two co hosts. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, Murphy might be working overtime today. The standard for success in Polygast is pretty low, right? For the bar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we try to keep it low so that, you know, expectations don't get too high. Yeah, yeah, manage expectations well. <laughs> Maybe that could be the title for today's episode, Managing Expectations. Nice. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a delayed start of Polycast episode 308. I'm the VN team, and today I am joined by Mega Bears fan. Who finally got things working, I think, hopefully, maybe. Yay. Makalua. We should just start and make the start music for this episode, the technical difficulties music. The buzzing. Oh, hi there, neighbor. Do you mind if I build a city here? And Canis Alvinus. Oh, dear. What was the, I forget. Nice. It works. <laughs> that sums up how this has been to this point quite nicely. All right. Now, quick, let's stop everything before it all goes wrong. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good show, guy. <laughs> all right. Yes, te- technical difficulties were a problem, but I think we're good now. Oh, yeah, but speaking of technical difficulties, hey, we have a spring patch. <laughs> Yay. The patch was what got me back playing again. Yes, finally. They only warned us about it, like, what, a month ago? Yeah, finally. Spring patch. It's the middle of May. You just barely made it in time. Oh, yeah, they are calling it a spring patch, aren't they? Yeah. I thought the February one was the spring patch. <laughs> no, apparently not. <laughs> are you trying to say that they sprung this one on us? Ha ha ha. Well, come on. We we have a pun quoted to keep up since Dan's not here. That's true. That's right. Without Dan, the rest of us have to pull our weight. In In this case, it was the opposite of springing it on us, because this is probably the most lead time I've seen on a (laughs) Praxis patch in recent memory. Remember the February patch in Civ 5 that came in March? No, I don't remember. That's too far back to be recent memory. (laughs) Yeah, not specifically, but that doesn't surprise me. That was more than a week ago. What are you talking about? And then after that, our beast wasn't born yet, lol. (laughs) After that, they stopped calling it monthly patches because they didn't want to get the month wrong again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they had to manage expectations. Just target a season. You'll probably be fine. Probably. Additions. Well, for joint wars and third-party war updates, players can now ask other players or AI to join wars they're already in. The trade screen allows the CB to be chosen when declaring a joint war. It also requires one party to have denounced the enemy for five turns. So no more surprise surprises, I guess. And the leader screen now makes it clear that the declaration is part of a joint war. Previously, it was always marked as a formal war. I suppose logic here is if you don't formally denounce them, how does your ally know that you plan to declare war or that you're dissatisfied? Well, you ask them. Yeah. yeah but... and in some cases, you could be asking someone you know is dissatisfied. So, hey, I hear you don't like them. Want to go beat them up? I guess your denouncement is obviously in the fact that you're asking them since they're already pissed off at whichever player it is. That works fine for humans, but when you start putting AI into the mix, you need some kind of cue to tell them that you're dissatisfied and that they might want to join it. The way it's described here, it sounds like it doesn't work the way that a regular war with a Cassus Belli work. There's some Cassus Belli where you don't need a previous denouncement, and it doesn't seem like those apply here. Like, they make it sound like you absolutely must have done the denouncement in order to do a joint war. I think for the AI purposes, they had to tether it to something, because otherwise you'd need a new mechanic to make the joint war work properly. It would have been significantly more challenging to make it work, period. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I just, like I said, I think it's a little weird that the mechanics are a little bit different for it. But, yeah, I mean, it's good to have it. I'd rather have it than not have it. And uh, the previous implementation itself was a little cancerous, so whatever. <laughs> yeah. People just accept joint wars at it like willy-nilly and then do nothing. Yeah, I'm hoping the AI was tuned for that. I don't remember seeing that in the patch list here, but hopefully it's in there somewhere. We would hope. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I've played several games since it came out. I haven't had any AI trained to me, and they used to regularly before the patch, so... Yeah, I've only been able to play like half a game so far, and very few of the new patch changes have been relevant as yet. But anyway, what else we got in this thing? 12 new historic moments focused on mid to late game. So there's the first shipwreck you excavate, the world's first shipwreck excavated, that's plus two and plus three respectively. There's first aerodrome fully developed, encampment fully developed, entertainment complex fully developed, and a water park fully developed. Those are all plus three. Now, first city with 25 pop. We didn't have that before. Apparently not. Uh, Plus one for your first city with 25 pop, and then plus two if it's the world's first city. World's first seaside resort and your first first seaside resort. And also for the world's first national park, it's actually a plus four and a plus three for just... I didn't say first. This is a national park fan, so maybe that's for all parks, which makes sense because they don't pop up that often. It looks like it's a plus three anytime you found a national park and plus four in yeah. the, the world's the very first. first. Not your first, but the world's first. Yeah, yeah. there's a few more world first bonuses in here this time. Right, which is good because a lot of them are things that you get mid-late game. But then again, one of the problems with a lot of these is uh, that you've got to be leading in some category in order to get these. So there's not much in the way of helpful catch-up things here. Uh, I think we need more end the game than we need catch-up. Well, yeah. In Civ 6. I mean, there's two ways to go about it. Either end the game sooner or make the final stages of the game more competitive. Yeah, but in the 4X, the latter is extremely difficult to do without like just yeah. completely flatlining skill impact. Right. It's very difficult. Our last little tiny addition is there are three new graphs on the for the Rise and Fall games. You now get an era score, total governor, and total governor titles. Little thing on your game summary screen. Woo. I mean... Still no Hall of Fame, though, right? No, no, no Hall of Fame. I just got to go to my Steam achievements to figure out who I've beaten the game as. Well, if they did a Hall of Fame, it would be an online Hall of Fame, which means you'd get your thing full of cheaters. And Oh, I won Domination Victory on a huge map on turn zero. Oh, I I wasn't talking about a leaderboard. I was talking about like the old Hall of Fame feature that was in the main menu for the game that just showed all of your final game scores and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, your local Hall of Fame. On to balance. Governor's got balanced a little bit. Pingala's librarian ability now is only 15% science and culture in the city instead of 20. Eh, that's not, I mean, I don't... Yeah, it's a tweak. It's a tweak. I, mean, I, don't, I didn't feel like that was overpowered or anything. I mean, it's just one city. I haven't been using him much because I usually go for the Magnus and the lady that gives builders plus one charge. Well, speaking of things that were OP that got tweaked, yeah. <laughs> Magnus' yeah. groundbreaker ability got reduced from 100% to 50%. No, you can have some, but you can't have the 100%. That was a little much. So it's uh, less abusive overflow now when you stack him with other things that are boosting walls or buildings and overflowing crap into units. I'd rather that they have fixed the overflow bugs, but, you know, whatever. Are they bugs? I mean, maybe they're not. I don't know. But, like, just the way that all the abilities are worded, it seems like they are bugs. So Yeah, that's been brought down a little bit. (laughs) But it's still strong. Yeah, they didn't want to completely nerf it, but they wanted to go, uh, not so much. All right, little government balance pass. Communism has had its bonus production per population move from 0.4 to 0.6, and its overall production bonus from 10% to 15%. Why? I guess they felt people weren't using it often enough. Uh, That's what I was going to guess, because I was going to say I usually end up in, in democracy just because... I mean, yeah. communism. They, they nerf democracy and buff fascism in communism, basically. To me, I usually pick what government based off of what policy slots are available. Yeah. There's very little they can do to these passive abilities that's going to change what governments I choose unless they actually start reshuffling which policies are available. The five combat bonus, the fascism, it's been buffed from four to five in the patch notes. You also get 50% to our unit production. Not peanuts, that you will feel that. <laughs> if you're fighting somebody equal tech. Yeah, but it's still like just barely more than what oligarchy used to provide. And that's a early game thing. Yeah, but, but your, your options are that or oligarchy for a unit bonus. And if you're stacking unit bonuses to fight, that's pretty attractive. Right. All that matters is the difference between the two values. Doesn't matter if it's 105 to 100 or 10 to 5. But I know that a four combat bonus is a lot better than a three combat bonus which is a lot worse than a five combat bonus and it's not linear so it's yeah, something you, weird you stack going on. great general and fascism together and you're fighting anywhere they don't have a general 
you're two-shotting things with identical units and no promotions on either side. If you have promotions on top of that, you're steamrolling equal tech. A pretty premier choice if you're trying to wrap the game up domination-wise. Because it'll just save you time, if nothing else. Your units will kill stuff faster. It's not at all bad if you just get there and you think a war's brewing, but you're not really on a military footing. Like, it lets you get geared up pretty quickly. Yeah, that's true. Things to do when you're not Australia? (laughs) (laughs) And democracy got its production per district moved from two to one. The bonus production. Yep. Uh adds up but it's not i that's not like drastic i don't think uh, i don't think they need to go drastic but they, they clearly felt that democracy was too strong late game compared to the other two options and wanted to tune it none of these things like look crazy but it's pretty obvious that's what they saw when they were making balance changes is that most people are running democracy oh uh, well they're at uh other little tweaks uh rebalance some of the policies military research and now gives plus two signs from military academies, seaports, and renaissance walls. Previously, that was only plus one and did not include the renaissance walls. Public transport is going to give 100 gold per appeal when replacing a farm with a neighborhood. And it was half that, only 50 gold before. Yeah, it comes up every once in a while, I guess. I don't have any, I haven't had to do that too many times with the replacing farm with a neighborhood. I don't think I've ever used that policy. Well, I'm just thinking... If you have a high enough appeal and you put a neighborhood there, you could get 500 gold out of that, which I guess at that point in the game is trivial. But And it does cost a builder charge, and those are scaling up. Was it always gold per appeal, or did it used to just be 50 gold, period? Uh, I feel like well, it used to be just gold, period. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Hmm. If it is per appeal, that might actually be worth using. Yeah, it's definitely nothing to sneeze at. If you can get four or 500 gold out of it... And if you've got a bunch of, like, captured builders or something like that that you have nothing else to do, then just plop a bunch of farms and then replace them with neighborhoods. Is it good enough that you would put down a farm and then you would immediately plop the district on top of it? Because that's clearly not the way it's intended to work, right? It's You spread your farms early and then you transition into population with them later. Yeah, if you've been slacking a little bit on your city development and you saw a place where you could temporarily put down the farm and then build the neighborhood on top of it mid-late game, I mean, maybe? Like I said, I think it's if you have the builders that you're not doing anything with, then yeah, sure, go for it. But I think if you're at the point where you're building or if you're buying builders, I guess maybe if you have one of the things that lets you um, get civilian units with faith and you're not doing anything with your faith, yeah, sure, spend that to purchase a bunch of builders and then plop down a bunch of farms and immediately replace them with neighborhoods for a crap ton of free gold. Heck, I'm thinking builders costing me at the moment, around the time I would get this, builders costing me, what, 300, 350 maybe? If you have four appeal tiles, you get 400 gold each and that's three charges. Well, so you get not going three gold. charges, right? You're going to get Probably six charges by the time you've got your your governor and you swap your policy for your builder production, if you're going to buy them. And it's 2,400 gold, and it's even better. Yeah. Of course, that depends on you having a lot of cities and they're all having good appeal, but... And you wanting a lot of neighborhoods. And that you don't have to work those farms in order to sustain those neighborhoods. Yeah. I would definitely buy a builder, swap my policies, buy a couple of builders, pop the farms down, build the neighborhoods on them, and get the free builder out of it, effectively, for the gold. And then just swap it back out when you're done. Yeah. Fills up on cost, but depending on how your tech progress is going with culture, I guess you could work that in. Well, and Ooh. by this point in the game, you're probably going to have a lot of your improvements made already. So you might have the farms down that you're going to use. True, but you normally putting your farms next to water and adjacent to each other for the adjacency bonuses if you're doing that. In which case, you probably don't want a neighborhood one up. Well, you scale down on that, though. Like the adjacency bonus becomes stronger. So if you're becoming less food constrained, I could see it depending. Yeah. Well, Rise and Fall also gave a reason why you'd want big cities. Yeah, that's true. And the last policy that got rebalanced was e-commerce. Previously, you got plus five production and plus 10 gold for your international trade routes. But now it gives you plus two production, and plus five gold for all trade routes. Because Amazon used to only be able to ship to Europe. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Amazon started shipping over here and then. Yeah, that always seemed a little bit backwards. The e-commerce was only good for international. It's like, I'm pretty sure it was local before it was international. Good change. I like it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's see. There's some little bit of sieve balancing for different ones. Victoria's Pax Britannica ability now additionally awards a free melee class unit when constructing a Royal Navy dockyard in a city founded on a foreign continent. So wait, are we getting a ship and a unit? 
No, we're getting two units. Uh, you get one unit when you found the city, and you get another unit when you oh, build your no, dockyard. Oh, dockyard. But only on a foreign continent. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Is this a thing anyone actually wants, though? I mean, like, I want my melee units to secure the continents when I'm placing the city. If the city's already established enough to have built a Royal Navy dockyard there. Yeah, I'd rather have some kind of economic benefit that rewards England for building overseas colonies, like boosting gold yield or culture or something like that, than just being given more units. Because, yeah, like you said, in most cases where you'd be using this, you've already used the unit to clear the space to make the city. Mm. Yeah. It's I was awkward because you shit. have to invest quite a bit to get that and then move it. In terms of bus, this is extremely, uh, extremely soft. <laughs> I feel like I'd want a ranged unit in a city like that to help protect it and a ship. Like, I'd rather get a ranged unit when I sell the city and a ship when I build a dockyard. Or, heck, even a free builder just to get the city, yeah. you know, up and running quicker. I mean, I'm probably sending a military unit to escort that settler anyway. Mm. Well, a lot of the attractiveness of her ability comes from capturing cities on foreign continents. You have a unit snowball. That's still a thing, potentially. This particular reward is just awkward that you are you have to build a Royal Navy dockyard in a distant city that they're founded recently. Then you have to move that unit into somewhere where it's relevant. It's just a strange bonus. But also the Royal Navy dockyard is so far down the list of things you're going to build in a new city. That's quite a wait. That's not strictly true with England. Well, it's a harbor. Um, so, you know, if you want the extra trade route. Yeah, because yeah. you're getting the extra trade route out of it. But it's also a production source for you. Because you're going to build it at the kind of point you can build your second dockyard improvement to get the adjacency bonus turned into production. So you take it with the policies that double your adjacency bonus, you put it next to a market because England gets the trade route from the market and the trade route from the Navy dockyard. So you get two trade routes out of it, plus a decent production bonus, plus a load of gold. Yeah, you're definitely wanting to use these. It's just a question of like, why a delayed melee unit at huge range? It's just an awkward way to buff them. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I'd never use the melee unit. You might. It's just it, it's not that attractive. Or you <laughs> get it, and you end up shipping it back to your home continent for other purposes. Or using it to attack whoever's on the new continent. Fine, like it's not useless, but it's not very strong, and it's awkward. It's like for establishing a beachhead sort of thing. Here's a free unit so you can keep pressing inland. A free unit after you invest a ton of hammers to set up your <laughs> trade routes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice if it gave you the free um, trade unit. Like Ooh. That you would definitely use, right? You've just got yeah. yeah. That's right. It would get that your, would your make, city yeah. set up faster. It would be mm. a much more immediate bonus that makes sense with what you're building. Yes. A lot of the colonies on other continents were founded in the purposes of trade. So, hey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Latoro's unique ability of the Swift Hawk, where they go around and pillage things, and now they've added pillaging an enemy plot causes that city to lose five loyalty on top of the plot being, you know, useless. So just in case Latoro wasn't annoying enough already. I was playing as uh, the Mapuche, I think, earlier this week. I think I noticed that there's no little pop-up or anything telling you that the city loses loyalty, because I think when you kill a unit... And that ability triggers, you'll see the little red minus 20 loyalty or whatever pop up on the city. Mm -hmm. I wasn't seeing that when I was pillaging tiles. So it was, you know, difficult, if not impossible, to tell whether or not that was actually You were actually working. getting that effect yet? Yeah. Mm. So that's something they might want to uh, fix if they haven't done so already. Okay, also rebalance. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce her name right. Dondox but... Warang. Thank you. <laughs> the governors established in the city provide. 3% culture and science for each promotion they have earned, including their first. Before, it was just a flat 10% for any governor, regardless of promotions. So now the more you promote the governors, the more bonus you're going to get. Weaker earlier, stronger earlier. Okay. Assuming you're promoting your governors and not just putting a governor in every city. More governors? Yeah. 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 Well, eventually you can have all the governors and promote at least a couple. Right, but this is almost like a wide versus tall thing. Do I want fewer governors with more promotions to make my cities super powerful in culture and science, or do I want smaller bonuses in all my cities? If it's a Civ game, the answer should always be wide. If it's any 4X, the answer should be wide, because you need incentive for conflict, or else it's less of a game. <laughs> okay, we have a few unit rebalances. Berserkers got their cost reduced by 20 production. 
combat strength when attacking was increased from plus seven to plus 10. And now their debuff when defending is negative five instead of negative seven. Samurai's also got dropped by 20 production and bumped up to 48 strength from 45. And the Georgian Kevsor? Kevsor? I don't know. Yeah, I would call it a Kevsor, but... Okay, but it also got 20 production knocked off and also 40 to 45 strength increase. So It is now not complete trash and inferior to swordsmen in every way. <laughs> That's useful. But I tested it. They still don't beat knights unless you're on hills. They're still really not that great. Yeah, these unique unit buffs help them, but because of their tech placement and not you can't upgrade into them, it's still a little awkward. Although the berserker can really hurt, <laughs> at least. What else we got on this list? More era balancing stuff? Basically, when the information era happens in one more turn, everybody goes to a normal age, so people don't have inter- eternal golden ages. Or eternal dark ages. Well, that's for if someone wins. Right. Now, I gotta wonder, the next two things are like, Manhattan Project and Operation Ivy are reduced in era score, and then the satellite moon landing and the moon landing and the Mars components also get a change in era score. Why aren't those listed with the other era score stuff and instead listed as era score historic moments rebalancing under eras? I was thinking the same thing. The logic there is a bit head scratching, but that's, that's been the case with the patch notes uh, since Civ 6 came out, really. I mean, either way, it's a balance change. So it fits under both, but... Yeah. Monasticism was nerfed by 25%. Yeah, I don't think I've ever used that. It's really good if you're in Dark Age. Yeah, I saw some strategies built around intentionally Dark Aging and like just running that all the time. Yeah, but you had to have built holy sites, which means you're probably going for religious play, which I'm kind of like meh on religious play. Yeah, it was a bit of a niche track because the person doing it was intentionally going science, but using that bonus. <laughs> well, holy sites don't require religion, but I guess they make it better. Yeah, oh, you might as well grab a religion if you're going to do this. Speaking of religion, religion now affects loyalty. It didn't before? Question mark? It didn't no, before. it does now. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Plus three loyalty so, for but... cities following your religion. Minus three loyalty for cities following another player's religion. I Means founding a religion has more of an advantage than previously. Oh, they fixed it. A no- number of envoys received from liberating city-states is boosted as you progress in the game. No more information era city liberation three era em- envoys. I would have preferred Thank to goodness. see it store the value you've had, but this is okay, too. I guess you can generate envoys from nowhere by letting someone take a city-state and then taking it. Sure, sure. Baby steps, baby steps. I think part of the idea is that there's a city-state that you can't possibly become the suzerain of because someone else has invested so many envoys into it. You capture them, and then even if they get liberated, that count is like reset so it's attainable for other players again. Well, the person liberating is going to have more envoys now, so it might get to the point where you're liberating city-states and you become suzerain by an impressive count because of the number of envoys. Yeah, we'll have to see how many envoys it actually provides, but I think the original idea was that you're basically resetting it so that they're attainable to all players again. Yeah. So if the player who was the suzerain doesn't do a good job of protecting them, then they lose those bonuses because it's going to be easy for other players to overtake them. If we could just introduce a mechanic to actually protect them decently without having to declare offensive wars. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Monobility updates. Well, now the governors and governor promotions now use promotion sets, which allows more than one governor type to be associated with promotion and vice versa. If I was a modder, that would mean something. Basically, it means that they uh, encapsulated stuff in such a way that you don't have to make a separate set of things for every person. Sounds like they're just reducing the amount of, you know, monkey work that needs to go into modding promotions. Like if you would go into some of the Civ 4 mods, you'd find... You go into the promotions in the Civipedia, and it would be like, oh, there's like six different promotions, and they all do the same thing. So you don't have to do that. Right. That just gets to all the bug fixes, the long list. Well, it's not a long list, but it's a list. It should be long. (laughs) Yeah, is there anything on here that sticks out? Uh, I don't think we need to go through every single one. Let's see. Well, the first one, I wonder if it, they also fixed the bug where cities that become capital after a capital is taken are also treated as a capital, such that they're all friggin' capitals, because uh, that would be nice. And it's not going to constantly show capital lost as, as the Civ gets conquered. 
So that's a oh, bonus. Yeah. But it would be nice if they also <laughs> if they also didn't consider everything a friggin' former capital. If a Civ got conquered, capital first, and then all only capitals were taken until they were conquered. So the, the the capital was lost like five times, and they're all former capitals. So you're locked out of doing things in the Diplo screen. With them. Like, come on, man. <laughs> I hope that was fixed. Apparently, great people cannot steal luxury resources out from underneath other players' districts. Hmm. That didn't actually remove the availability of that luxury from the other player previously, did it? I don't think so. I assumed it just duplicated it. it was just, yeah, it was just like an extra copy. Well, in either case, you can't do it anymore. You can't use loyalty pressure to flip a city you liberated anymore. Yeah, I was reading that, and I had to, I had, it took me a minute to understand whether that was meaning that... When I conquered it, it wouldn't do the thing, but now, okay. Well, basically, that bug report we covered on the last episode of this uh, podcast, it won't happen anymore. Because when you liberate it, this text tells you that you won't apply loyalty pressure. And yet, you clearly did in the previous patch. So that was a bug, and they fixed it, basically. (laughs) And now it does what the text says it does when you liberate it. Let's see. Fix bugs relating to expelling the units out of the city or borders when applicable. You shouldn't be expelled from a free city when it flips due to loyalty unless the city flips to a major civ and rules require it. Yeah, okay. So no more getting like pushed out by free cities instantaneously all the time. Yeah. Cities cannot be founded on tiles with districts? How was that ever even possible? You raise the city. Yeah, raise the city and found it on a district. Don't the districts disappear? It was possible before when the rack lacks minimum city distance it present in island situations. Ah, yeah, okay. So were you actually able to build cities inside other players' borders? Because how would there ever be a district that's not inside of a player's border? I'm guessing it's a player building their own city on it. Ah, yeah, gotcha. Oh, you're trying to build them like super, super, super close. Yeah, like you built an encampment, then you built the city on your encampment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That makes sense. I thought it was talking about other players' districts. Yeah, I thought so too at first, but now I'm picturing this. That's pretty lulzy. I wonder if you actually retained the district bonus in the previous patch when doing that. Oh, well. That's a good question. They're probably not compatible. Why not? That'd be hilarious, though. You've got, like, campus district on top of a city. (laughs) And the yields just look awful. I'd be surprised if that's how it worked. You probably just deleted the district. Probably. Let's see. Oh, the Limes policy now actually works for Renaissance walls, including George's walls. Hooray. Hooray. Since George is all about walls. Yeah. And there's a bunch of little text fixes of this. One of the graphic fixes was don't play paradrop animation if the destination tile is not visible to the current observer. Can we uh, set that for all animations? Yeah, that'd be great. (laughs) Please. That's been a problem since Civ 5. And it never made any sense because when I was in university doing computer science classes, the entry level graphics design class taught us how to bound the box and clip everything else out. Don't render anything that's not on the screen. Why is this still happening in a AAA game in a second iteration as a AAA game with this bug? I guess nobody took that class. It's <sighs> it's common sense. It shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, who is benefiting from off screen animations? Why? What? You don't need to animate the whole world. You just have to animate the window into the world. Oh. For clarification, though, I think this particular graphics fix isn't referring necessarily to things that are not in the visible window because you might have the visible window hovering over a place that your sieve doesn't have visibility into. That's you true. You mean, Enter the Fog of War? Yeah. But if it's similar, though, because if it's in the Fog of War, it's outside the viewable territory which means it shouldn't be rendering anything there. Well, true, to an extent, because you still want to update the map. So if someone builds a city or a district or something in the Fog of War, you can still see that. So it's got to be doing some updates. It should really be updating on tile reveal. When the tiles are visible to your units, you get an update there. Not only does it add to the overhead for the animation, but the animation also adds to the time lost. Why are we sitting here waiting for an animation off screen when we should be busy having the computer do its stuff so we can do our turn? Yeah. This costs half hour to hours per game by itself, I bet. There's a number of little AI tweaks and things. Is there anything that sticks out to you guys? I mean, the first thing says it respects and uses new rules for the joint wars and third party wars. And it's like, I certainly hope so. Right. 
<laughs> Let's add a new mechanic and not tell the AI how to do it. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I bet it's still kind of spotty with it. Probably. But I'm sure it's improved relative to the previous patch. Fixed AI strategies, including yield priorities and era strategies. So hopefully that means that the AI actually like knows that it needs to try to not get a dark age. <laughs> Hopefully. I, if you want to sit there and keep doing Dark Age and let us come stomp on you, I guess, but, you is, know. Is that so the they're going to, like, was... prioritize yields, too, that are relevant to what they're attempting to accomplish. That's also helpful. Yeah. And it says fixed issues regarding embarking units near enemy warships. That would be a good thing to fix. <sighs> yeah. Just ignore that unit in the water. It's not Tully about to come take your city. Many multiplayer things, updates that uh, stand out to anybody. Mm-hmm. Or UI things, Phil? <laughs> There's uh, nothing Firaxis has done with the UI that impresses me because you're still expected to do thousands of extra clicks than necessary for across a game. So Still not seeing a build queue. Yeah, there's still no yeah. build queue, but there's still like nothing that suggests any emphasis on end user experience in terms of number of inputs. One thing that I do see in the UI is that they added food needed for population growth in city details panel. That's another thing that I'm like, really? That wasn't already there? Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I think that sums up the patch. <laughs> yeah, just about. Yeah. We fixed some things, but not enough. Because there's complaints below that, well, what about this? But what about that? So, you know, they fix a lot of things people have been asking about, but there's still things I've got left to do. There's a post from the Blue King. He says, Ice tiles should provide science. Just take a look at how much of today's scientists are learning about our planet from melting glaciers. Maybe early in the game they should not provide any bonus, but late game, for example, atomic modern information era, they should maybe provide plus two, plus four, and plus six, or three, six, and nine. Science, as it is difficult to create cities next to the ice. This would make the late game more interesting and encourage (laughs) players to conquer those parts of the map. Uh, even today on a percentage basis what percentage of our scientific discovery over like the last say 60 years has come from the ice it's useful stuff but on a percentage basis it's not that huge or alternatively instead of having to found cities there have some other mechanic where you set up things like research outposts and that could be something throughout the entire game maybe you put a research outpost in a jungle or in a forest or next to a mountain or something like that then late in the game you start putting them on arctic tiles it's something like maybe this uh, scott rasmussen station maybe that's not a wonder you build in your cities maybe that's a wonder that you build with military engineers or great person or some mechanic like that you know kind of like the archaeologists doing the dig sites and in the case of Civ Five, building landmarks. Well, people yeah, attack was... these because I've never heard of them being attacked in reality. But and... well, you can't attack the archaeologist sites, can you? No, but you can capture the archaeologist. The same would be true of a tick research archaeology site, right? I just think like, it's you an can still implementation, like to make it tile yields. Like I, I could get behind something like a state research station or something if it had a significant enough impact on the game to be worth including. But man, like a city out in the ice, like. <laughs> There's still no cities uh, like that. From a current structure of um, like ice tiles kind of serve as a hard edge to the map as well, right? You've yeah. got your soft edge, which is like your tundra, because you just don't want to settle it because it's not particularly effective, which means that it's going to be, under the current structure, very difficult to build those kind of cities anyway. But the idea that we expand the culture archaeology system to maybe also include a more interactive science system, I think that's got some potential in it. A lot of the structure's already there. Like something like maybe giving scouts charges, and then they spend those charges to conduct field research. Almost kind of similar to how in Beyond Earth you had the scouts that studied like yeah. the, uh, the anomalies and stuff like that, but maybe even make that more versatile. Beyond Earth mechanics, let's do it. <laughs> there, some of them were good ideas, they just weren't... Oh, that was decent, yeah. ...particularly well executed in context of the rest of the game. Yeah, there's a lot of nice stuff that Beyond Earth does. It captures this idea of exploration really well. Another thing, too, is if we want to make all of the ice and tundra not feel like a whole bunch of wasted space, we could also try finding a way to maybe make the map of Civ represent a sphere instead of a cylinder so that there just isn't as much of that. (laughs) Oof. 
Have I feel fun like programming that. I feel like on a hex grid that should actually maybe be easier than it was on the squares of Civ Four. You did have to write a lot on Civ Four. That's true. I remember playing it a couple times and not liking it. But well, the main issue with it, in my opinion, was actually it broke maintenance calculations. Yeah. Because um, the way that game calculated maintenance actually made it so that cities the same distance apart were treated as further apart on toroidal relative to um, round and even further than flat. Like flat had the least distance. But with a hex grid, it actually seems like it should be easier to make a map that actually has more of a rounded shape like what you would see on an actual atlas of the Earth. So that when you get down towards the poles, the poles are actually fewer tiles wide than the equator is. I feel like that's the abstraction of the ice being useless as four. I think so. But you can still settle as many cities along the southernmost edge of the map as you can on the equator. But why would you? There's literally no benefit. Unless there's fish, there's nothing. But that's kind of the point, is it all just becomes dead space. So either make it be worthwhile in some way or give you something to do with that space or just not have that space. What's wrong with having a little bit of dead space for maneuvering, though? Well, because when are you ever actually maneuvering in that space? Because no one's built anything there. Oh, when if I'm trying you go to toroidal, city, like you're <laughs> even today, it's pretty impractical to like cross the north or south pole as a path to somebody else. I mean, missiles can do it or something, but aside Plays, from that, yeah. yeah. How do you represent it on your map? I mean, are we thinking you would build a whole map on a sphere, effectively, and rotate around well, it? Civ 4 did this. If you scrolled up, it was just well, like it, how scrolling sideways works. Yeah, but even... It, it just kind of projected it onto a sphere. It didn't actually... It sort of cut the edges of the map up so it would fit into the sphere shape and put, like, an ice cap-looking thing on top to hide the ugly. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> One thing you could do is you could make a grid that looks like a soccer ball where you'd have like maybe some dead space between certain tiles. I'm not necessarily saying that's a good idea. I'm just saying it's something that's hypothetically possible. Or again, just have a hex grid, but just not make it as wide at the top and bottom as it is in the middle, but still have the horizontal wrapping. The only way you could do that effectively is if the tiles were different sized when they got closer to the poles. Because otherwise you have to cut spaces out, which means the hex grid is not really a grid anymore. And then you still need a way to project that in a flatter form for everybody who's used to playing it in a, like we do now to understand where everything is on the map. And that's going to look weird. Well, it would just be like looking at a two-dimensional map of the Earth where it looks like that oblong. So the one that looks like somebody took an orange peel and sliced it up, sort of. If you know what I mean, Greenland mega size. Well, no, not necessarily that, but you, you've got that, and then you've got the ones that just are kind of like football shaped, mm. without the gaps in between. Again, we're talking about abstractions, right? So I'm just saying hypothetically. How would you make that scroll, though? I mean, you go to the edge of the map, and then all of a sudden you're halfway across to the other side of the map. You could travel 25 percent of the mini map space in one tile move. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty amazing to picture. <laughs> now that you mention it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it would be easy to implement. I'm just saying hypothetically, you know, if we're talking about what to do with all the dead space that is ice and tundra, I'm just saying that as an alternative to making it do something, not having it is another. It's not an easy thing to solve, but I think it would be doable. In my opinion, Praxis has it right when they say, if it's too complicated, don't do it. I mean, how does having the map spherical and then projecting it weirdly on a flat plane, how does that make the game any more fun? I'm not saying necessarily to make it a map that's on a sphere. I'm saying to make a grid that is more sphere-like in shape. I understand that, but if you do that, you end up with projection things where you, if you're on the North Pole, you take a step from one tile, and suddenly you're on the other side of the mini-map. Yeah, that's awkward. Yeah, that causes problems, and that's just going to confuse people who don't know anything about projections, and it's going to confuse people who don't care about maps. It doesn't add enough to the game. It doesn't add narrate. anything to the game, really. Because if the only reason you're adding it is so you don't have to put some blank tiles that do nothing, just put the blank tiles in. There's no reason to not put them in. Yeah. Okay, so ice tiles, you can't use them for anything. The same's kind of true of desert tiles, right? They're pretty useless. Like, flat desert's not worth having, you don't settle it. But is there merit to having sections of the map which are inhospitable, where you've got these big open spaces that potentially you can move armies through and you've got good sight lines for ranged units? Like, does that add value? 
there's some tactical value to that, especially if the distance between cities and the size of hexes is tuned a little better. I don't know that that would work in some six, but yeah. And realistically, you could even make things sort of equivalent like to today's Sahara or like the EU4 wasteland implementation where you're not even able to move armies across this stuff because you just can't. <laughs> From a real life logistics perspective, you're not going to move an army across the Sahara for most of history, oh, except space. for like along Civ-wise. very specific lines. And same Just... thing with mountain ranges, although mountains are already a gate in Civ 6. So you already have a tile that's like that. It's just rare. And that's mountains. So you could make that de- like very large deserts similar uh, to mountains. That goes along with the why don't we stop having one desert tile in a single spot in the middle of a bunch of good tiles and just collect yeah. all the desert and put it in a few places. That'd be nice. Yeah, and it could be uh, something that you work around with a lot more consideration than you do now without actually having to settle cities in it and like work desert tiles, which <laughs> so, part of that is that our hexes are pretty big areas of space, right? You split our current hexes up into multiple hexes and you say a city now takes multiple hexes. Yes, um, I, I think that would help if the game's performance could handle it. It would also solve a lot of unit movement and mobility issues. Yes, yes, it would. If you kept the units the same cost, yes. Also, left units also only taking up one hex on the smaller hexes. Yeah. Yeah. All of this, yes. And gave them more movement. Uh, potentially. If you increase the number of hexes, you have to give them more movement. Otherwise, you can't get to the other side of the map before the end of the game. Yeah. Well, or have more ways for movement to scale up as the game progresses. So yeah. you abstract the idea of having automated vehicles and all units now have access to trucks or whatever. So they move faster. So at the end of the game, your units have like four or five movement, even your basic melee units. Whereas at the start of the game, maybe they only had two because at the start of the game, you're not traveling as far can also make roads a lot better than they are now then well yeah uh, it solves a lot of the logistical moving unit problems as well for the ai and that they bump into each other and can't get past it's annoying when moving your own units too like you'll order a yeah. bunch of units to move across your empire and then they will path in a way where it interrupts and you have to give them multiple orders again or alternatively, there's like a narrow pass and then some other unit moves into that pass and all of your units decide to turn around the opposite direction and you don't notice that for like three or four turns. Yep. And you're like, ugh. Why are you queuing movement on units? That's your first problem. Yep. I usually don't, but whenever I do, I regret it. <laughs> well, the yeah. problem is if you don't queue units, then you're like quadrupling or yes, more your inputs. As... And when you're doing that with like 20 units... <laughs> Quadrupling your inputs is not insignificant. This is where we're getting those thousands of extra inputs issue. Yep, I wish I could just stack them all into a city, have them all move along the road, and then unstack at the destination city. Maybe yeah, use like a deploy feature like the Air Force? You're still only doing them one at a time, though, and it still gets tedious. It'd be nice to have some kind of mechanic where you could just like click and drag over a bunch of units and tell them all to go somewhere. Yeah, and have it work. <laughs> right, which is the hard part. <laughs> I mean, the worst is the auto-update of pathing without the player even, like, being informed of this. Yeah. The main issue is moving it within your empire, right? If you're moving it outside of your empire, there's other things you've got to worry about, people's units, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you're also much less likely to have many turn waypointed setups of units because you're probably moving into Fogolar at that point. Which means that you're not going to give like a 20 turn or even a 10 turn or a 5 turn order blind into enemy territory. Like you just don't do that in practice very often. Unless it's across water, in which case there's very little that actually does get in your way. Yeah. Well, then, realistically, this just means making it so that if something's in your way on a road, you can go past it probably solves most of these issues. Well, it happens when you would end your tur- like you run out of movements on top of other units on that road then you move one square less that turn right but at least but the, it then you're moving off the road and you're potentially giving units more movement than they're supposed to have you stay you on stop. the road you stay okay. on the road and you stop because what happens at the moment is it runs off the road and then it takes three turns to get back to the road yeah pretty hard to automate this efficiently actually Yes. With, with just auto pathing generation. If you had some sort of vector system or like they enter like some sort of other layer while in transit, but you have extra mechanical complications from those kinds of implementations. But it would be nice if you could just order a path for your unit and have it stay on that path no matter what. And then uh, if it can't progress, then it just stops. That's, that's all it does. And it keeps that. That would be a nice feature to implement. 
Because then you could force everybody on the roads. You could decide if they're mm-hmm. going off the roads or not. And then you could just ignore that until they're in position. And if you lose a turn or two, they're fine. You can live with that. Or you can micromanage it yourself if you want to save those turns or two of movement. But that would be the least expensive from a programming standpoint implementation is just hold this path that I have showing now. Yeah, the problem is that declarations of war can happen very quickly, right? That's what stops it. You can still it hold the path. Working. Or if the path becomes impossible, then you just stop and the unit prompts you again. But otherwise, you hold the path. Uh, if a declaration of war took several turns to actually occur from when you issued it, you could then start prohibiting units moving into each other. But up until that point, you could have units sharing space, like if you're at peace. Ooh. What if you're already in a war and you just want to reposition units? Then you typically want to be much more careful about the repositioning and issue individual commands anyway, right? Not necessarily, no, especially not in an end game. <laughs> if I'm pathing through like seven of my own cities at war, I don't give a crap about what's happening inside those True. seven cities. Yeah. The trade routes at that point need to be automated too, but that's another issue. Bring back Civ 4 trade routes. Those are certainly the least obtrusive. <laughs> Online services engineer. Yeah, hopefully that's not add microtransactions job offer. Hopefully it's a improve multiplayer stability kind of thing. I don't think it's either of those things. Yeah. Like, look at the bottom of it. Like, they're looking for console development experience. Yeah. That's what's confusing me, because Civ isn't going to go console. XCOM, though, maybe. But XCOM already is console. Well, there you go. It's already there, which means the architecture must already be in place. Do they have online for XCOM? I've never played the newer XCOM. I don't have it on console because I've got it on PC. But my assumption is that it, it's got the same online multiplayer that PC has. Um, okay. But the infrastructure is going to be in place for it, right? And I can't see that they're going to do a new engine for, presumably they're working on whatever's next for XCOM. But I would assume they're going to use the same infrastructure and engine. I mean, it could be anything. We'll see. <laughs> they, they could even mm. be doing new IP. Because, like, yeah. they're not particularly good with online stuff in general. So if they're trying to build any game that is needing good multiplayer, they need somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm. Maybe that Microsoft uh, Sea of Thieves game has encouraged them to uh, revive Sid Meier's Pirates on consoles or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean like, could... compare how something like Fortnite runs compared to Civ 6 with a bunch of people in it. I know they're different games, but... <laughs> well, right, but if you can make a real-time shooter work seamlessly in multiplayer, you should be able to make a turn-based strategy game. Yeah, I mean, you have to sync more mm. with a turn-based strategy, but you're syncing more for, like, five to eight people, not a hundred <laughs> in real time. And you, yeah. because it's not real time, you can get away with some stuff that you couldn't otherwise... Yeah, but there are a whole different set of logistical challenges, right? Yeah. Like Fortnite's logistical challenge is you've got to be able to scale your hardware effectively. You've got to be able to have a lot of concurrent connections. Like You've got to be able to manage sessions effectively. But the quantity of data you're passing is small, but it you need it to be small. passed very quickly. Like You need to know whether somebody was hit and where somebody is precisely, right? Now, you don't need any of that with Civ, but you do have vast amounts of data to pass around. You do need a little bit of concurrent stuff because most MP games are simultaneous turns and Mm -hmm. you need to be able to resolve that properly when two people are trying to do something near each other with their units. But it's it's mostly different. Yeah. Well, I feel like the logistical challenges are quite different. Still, how much data do you really need to send if you built your game well? (laughs) You'd think it would just be whatever the heck changes in the state based on player inputs. Like, how is this particularly different from RTS in terms of managing unit locations and such like that? Oh, I mean, it should be comparable, right? The problem with Civ 5 always seemed to have was the maps get out of sync, which I don't understand why that would happen. Yeah. Like, you'd think you just stand the map once, right, and be done with it. <sighs> now, syncing issue is an issue in uh, the Paradox games as well, although Paradox games, as of the last two, three years, have been much better at it than Civ, which is interesting to me. But, you know, going back more years than that, Paradox games are worse uh, than Civ 5, sync-wise. So they've done something to make it better that actually works. Yeah, I'm not seeing any mention of multiplayer on the XCOM 2 PlayStation Store. 
I mean, if they're working on some project, they're probably not going to... It could just be future proofing as well, right? Like, yeah. they know they took XCOM out to console. They've got to think that in future they're going to want to take something out to console, potentially. If they're going to hire somebody and they're only going to have one person for it, they need to know that that's there for the future. Support the ongoing Polycast Patreon campaign. Collective achievements. Personal incentives. Month-to-month -month commitment. A thank you to lead patron Candace Albinus and all other supporters of the show through this measure. For more information, visit thepolycast.net slash Patreon. <laughs> Call, Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 441212887659. That's 441212882Polly. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. It's ridiculous. And this is before we get into the city screen stuff or any of that. City screen is just a disaster. Yeah. Or the city list, too. The demographic city list. You used to be able to change city builds from there, but now you can't. This is all stuff that they've done in the past and took out for whatever god unknown reason. Or just didn't bother to put in because they didn't feel it was important. I think it's a direct result of having a board game developer as the head developer rather than a old school developer of strategy games. I love Ed Beach. He's a good person. He's a good developer, but he just doesn't understand user interface as well. And nobody else at Firaxis seems to either. And You don't even need that, though. You just need somebody who is looking to optimize for number of inputs. It doesn't have to be like an old strategy game person. People who make Microsoft Word know how to like connect Alt Fs to bring up your files. <laughs> they, like, that's been around for more than two decades. And stuff like that could be implemented in Civ, has been implemented in Civ in previous iterations of the game. It, it can't be that hard. It's just a matter of prioritizing it, thinking it's worth the money to bring in resources to do it. Yeah. And they clearly don't. I don't like that. <laughs> so I'm going to rag from on it pretty much eternally. And that's just how it is, because it, it's a significant component of the experience of players playing. And it goes unappreciated. Thank you for listening to Polycast episode 308. I've been Mega Bears fan, along with the me and team. Right click the F button on your touchpad to pay your respects. Makalua. You want me to do what with my F button now? <laughs> the buzzing. What's that? There's a great person who can fix the internet. And Canis Albinus. Thank you for listening to Game Design Cast with people who think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in a couple weeks. Sure, time zone with Mackie, right? Uh, no, I actually am on Pacific time, so I think I'm oh. hour, one or two hours even earlier than Mackie. So oh, okay. yeah, this, he's got the imagine problem. I this see. started at I 9 a.m. for me, so I have to get up almost as early as I have to get up for work. Dan, you gave me an extra work day. Doing this as an internship for exposure. Yes, <laughs> I'm also a fan of exposure. Oh, you'll get paid in exposure. Yeah, for you. <laughs> We can either try to pick someone up uh, as a scab, or we can just go. Yeah, I know, it's time for the show. <laughs> oh, is that what that was? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an alarm. Uh, Otherwise, I might sleep through sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's my... Uh, Your zero-minute warning? <laughs> yeah, that's my last line of defense. If I'm not actually up by then, I can at least roll out of bed and throw the headset on and start. <laughs> it's kind of rough on Canis, like, like inviting him with, him with no time. No time. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, I go, go going. going. And I'm hearing some and Phil I'm echo. Hearing some Phil. Yeah, we're going to hear everyone echo until he aligns it. <laughs> there we go. That should be better. Yay. Yeah. Okay, so do we think we're ready to try going live and hope everything doesn't blow up <laughs> on us? Yeah, let, let's, let's try to get the live thing going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Trust.
Oh, I, he- I hear myself in the chat on a stream delay. Okay, but no one else? And, well, I probably will soon. No, I- I'm only hearing myself at the moment. Oh, well, that's weird, because you should at least be hearing everybody that's on Skype. You can't <laughs> hear me th- thinking things at you? What? <laughs> uh, yeah, this all worked when I did it with Dan on... What is it, Wednesday or whatever? I'm toggling through different microphone settings. Hopefully something will work. Anybody hear me now? It's going to be a delay. I'll let you know if I hear you. Okay. I hear something from you twice, because that'll be the signal that we got this going. Why? Why is it not working? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think Candace needs to reset his noise gate. Uh-oh. Yeah, I hear some typing. Dang it, what the heck? This microphone is just a pain in the ass. Still nobody hearing me in the live stream? I haven't heard you repeat yourself yet. Uh, okay, well, I don't know what else I can do. I'm so short of stopping the stream and restarting and hoping it works during the restart. I don't know what else to do. Well, we can always go with the classic. Have you tried turning it on and off? <laughs> All right, I mean... Yeah, I guess. All right, well, let me give it a try. You're back in internets. All right, there we go. Okay, I, th- I think we're good now. Hopefully everyone can hear us on the live stream. Uh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> all right, all right. Phil, you want to get us started? <laughs> yes, all right. 12 new historic mo- his- uh, historic moments. Post- that- wow, I cannot for the words. Phenomena. <laughs> Sometimes there's RNG on land or whatever, but for the most part, the person leading is the one they played the best. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Did we just dropped lose somebody? Yeah, buzzing. the buzzing dropped from the call. Hopefully we get him back. Yeah, he was saying earlier that he was having some internet connectivity issues, so hopefully he comes back. Sorry, I just got distracted because Windows tried to do an update. <laughs> no, no Windows. Windows. Bad Windows. Timing. Yeah. <laughs> right, as if we haven't already had enough stuff go wrong today. Why do you have a active hours, quiet hours thing if you're not going to use it? Yeah. Why I mean, seriously, I set the daytime hours so I can do stuff and not have this happen. Why are you doing this in the middle of it? I mean, I already know you're going to do it automatically anyway, so why don't you just do it when I'm not using it? Welcome, everybody, to Windows Ranting Podcast, episode 308. <laughs> <laughs> can apply similar arguments to trade drop prompt spam in Civ 6. Well, to be fair, this podcast did start out with upgrade to XP from Vista. And I remember <laughs> those days. <laughs> yeah, I, I do too. You need to actually hire that UI person they posted for the job floor mm-hmm. first. <laughs> oh, you probably realized you might needed a little help there? Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's have- better late than absolutely never. That's true. True. There's, like, some design skill there that goes beyond coding. Surprise polycast appearance. I was actually downstairs eating lunch when the phone call came in. <laughs> Phil was like, hey, do you want to join? Do you want to be on polycast? And then <laughs> the Skype started ringing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. could have gone worse. Yeah. That's the best thing we can say about it. Could have gone worse. Could have gone worse. <laughs> Just like the game. Could have gone worse turn blockers for like this unit that still has movement that's near hard terrain that can't do actually do anything this turn needs order so you have to space bar that unit you will hit oh. next turn and it will select that unit and you have to hit next turn another time this is a unit i've already given orders to but it still had a move and i do believe that the skype mp3 recorder is recording all of this so dan might have some blooper reel slash uh clip show content this is the kind of thinking that leads to things like the Apostolic Palace. <laughs> All right, I have stopped the stream. That went swimmingly with no flaws whatsoever. And oh, it was, it was that was the optimal, yeah. optimal episode. <laughs> I would change nothing about that experience. <laughs> I'm sure Dan will like to change some things about that experience when he sees the file. But... Yeah. Well, I mean, he could pretty well <laughs> safely cut out the first 20 some minutes and it wouldn't hurt anything. So it's not yeah, that bad. Yeah, but he has to get it down to an hour. So something's getting shelled for another day. This is pretty consistent to our usual episode run length if you do chop the 20 minutes of tech support at the start, though. <laughs> yeah, he'll just have more Oops. in the bank for when he has to make a totally not a clip show. We did not fall off topic except for at the start when we were trying to figure out how to get the damn thing running. <laughs> That's not really off topic either. 
which I still don't understand what the heck the deal was there, because, again, I just rebooted it, and it friggin' seemed to work, so... Well, welcome to anything involving broadcasting, basically. I didn't do anything, and the internet stopped working, and then started working, and then stopped working. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, like I said, Murphy was working overtime this morning. Oh, yes. In my family, we have a saying about Murphy. Yeah. He was an optimist. Yeah. It was offline for so long, I opened it and took one more turn. Perfect. Civ 6 design ideas. Civ 6 design ideas. <laughs> we'll see what he calls it. Should be interesting. Record date? May 19th, 2018. Civilization 4, 5, and Beyond Earth Sound Clips. Copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.